services. I've been working in conservation for 25 plus years. And for the last five years, Dr. Megan Jones and I have been studying women in conservation leadership. And so today's panel is very special to us. We have five absolutely inspiring women who are rock stars. They really are. These are super special people, and they're leading us in the conservation fields around the world. Thank you all for joining us today. I'm really excited to have you all uh, hear from these women and in our panel discussion. I hope that you will all ask lots of questions and continue the conversation afterwards. It's already been an amazing conference for women's leadership and conservation with the 30 wonderful trainees who have been here for the last three days. And we'll be doing the women's leadership pop-up at lunch today, so I hope to see you all there as well to begin to think about how we can take these ideas forward and do conservation differently. So thank you. Before we get started, the organizers of the conference have a gift for not only our esteemed conservation leaders, but for all conference attendees. It's one that is intended to tie us together in the days to come, as well as remind each of us of our core values, a theme of the conference. All these values connect us together in the work that we do. This conference's theme is Open the Door to Diverse Voices. We are diverse in our views, in the work we do, in the places we come from, and in our backgrounds. But we are tied together with our values. Values like inclusion, purpose, courage, compassion, integrity, joy, trust, persistence, peace, and passion. We have something special that comes from you, comes to you from people living with wildlife inside a protected area specifically the Asa National Reserve. The gift is handmade by these people who are part of a group called Kusharika. <laughs> these people who are part of this group coexist with wildlife such as lions and elephants. Here I present to each of our plenary panelists a bracelet with values that are inherent to the work we do each day. The bracelets, which all of you will receive too, are intended to remind us of these values that bring us all together, tie us together, and connect us as we move forward in developing new visions for the future of conservation. Now please turn to someone sitting or standing near you, who you don't know yet, and take 30 seconds to introduce yourself, and then turn your attention back to me. So I'm so pleased to have these five women here, and I want to do a very brief introduction because we want to spend our time hearing from them, right? There are more extensive biographies in the program, in the conference program, okay? So these are very brief introductions. So first, starting from left to right, we have Preeti Pram. She's the Executive Director at the Center for Wildlife Studies located in Bangalore, India. Dr. Pram is a conservation scientist working on issues related to mammalian extinctions, effects of anthropogenic pressures, voluntary resettlement of people, tourism trends, human wildlife conflict, and land use change around Indian parks. She was named a National Geographic Emerging Explorer in 2012 and was selected as one of India's Power Women by Femina the same year. In 2013, she was named a Woman of the Year by El India. Last year, she was the recipient of the Women of Discovery Award and the Rolex Award for Enterprise. Let's welcome her. Before working for UN Environment, 
Dr. Masunda worked for the Zambian government, Ramsar Convention, and WWF, the WWF. Her professional experience led her to work with several governments across the world, cutting across Africa, Asia, and Latin America. She was the first Ted Hollis Scholar at University College London, and she is also the founder of the Network of African Women Environmentalists. Let's welcome her. <laughs> to her left, we have Musimbi Kanyoro, the board chair of United World College and Women's Learning Partnerships, who until this past year served as the president and CEO of the Global Fund for Women. Dr. Kenyoro is a Kenyan human rights advocate with a long history of recognizing and supporting women's work and roles related to the environment. She was a nominee in 2005 of the 1,000 Women for the Nobel Peace Prize. She was also awarded the Changing, Changing the Face of Philanthropy Award and the Women, Leadership, and Human Dignity Award, among many others. She is currently, she recently completed her four-year term as a member of the World Bank Gender Advisory Group. Please welcome her. Okay. Next we have Alice Ruisa. She's the Africa Lead for Worldwide Fund for Nature, WWF International. She's also a development practitioner passionate about connecting the dots between nature, human capital, and development. She's currently the Africa lead at WWF for, in WWF International. And prior to her work at WWF, she was at Conservation International, where she oversaw the Vital Signs Monitoring Program, a program which collects and integrates data on agriculture, ecosystems, and human well-being across a number of East African countries. Prior to her work with CI, Ms. Ruisa worked for the United Nations Development Program, team leading the Environmental Finance Unit in Africa. Last year, she was named an Aspen New, Fellow, New Voices Fellow, indicating her commitment and leadership to development expertise. She's passionate about addressing the intersection of human capital, specifically girls' education and natural capital. And finally, last but not least, we have Leela, Dr. Leela Hassan. She is the co-founder and executive director of Lion Guardians and the co-founder of Pride Lion Conservation Alliance, one of our conference hosts. Dr. Hassan has worked on conservation issues in East Africa for more than 20 years and is passionate about working with communities to further conservation goals. Mm -hmm. She has won numerous prestigious awards, one being CNN's Top 10 Heroes in 2014, and she's the recipient of this year's Explorers Club's President's Award for Conservation.
those spaces where people believe in you and who you have to be and what you can be is, um, is absolutely fundamental and phenomenal as a woman and as a young girl. Um, and, and, and in responding to you, what, what do I consider my greatest achievement? I think for me, what I consider my greatest achievement, on my card I have a picture, that is the everlasting flower from Lorenzori that I took at nearly 4,000 meters. And when I climbed Lorenzori with 25 men, I was the only woman that made it to the summit um, in 2008, um, I stood there and looked and saw three glaciers in front of you, and I realized I was at the center of the universe smack in the middle of the equator. And at that moment, I realized the price and beauty of my continent, having lived in Switzerland for three and a half years. And then I realized that this continent actually gave the world what the world has. This is where Lucy was found. I mean, I stood there and then I looked and I thought, oh my God, this is it. And it gave me such humility because for 10 days, I did have a phone. It was totally silent, and all I could hear was the sound of water. I came back from that mountain, and I realized the work we do, we have to come to a space with such humility. Because when you stand on top of a mountain, it humbles you so much, and also teaches you a lot to understand and keep researching, understanding why science is fundamental to what we do. say my, the home where I grew up prepared me for leadership. Um, I mean, I'll start with my father. My father was the head of national parks and wildlife when I was growing up and uh, traveled with him everywhere. But also my mother, the leadership that I saw her present at the time, you know, um, it's amazing because even though she, she wasn't working at the time, she was looking after us. You could feel her leadership. You could see this is the person who is the strength of this household. This is the person who's in charge of our homework. This is the person who's in charge of me going to school. Another an important thing about, about them is that the importance of education. And my father had grown up at a time when girls did not go to school. Uh, his own sisters hadn't gone to school. They'd been married off. And he told us that that experience made him realize, especially seeing one of them um, die early during childbirth, pushed him to, to say, I will, if I, when I grow up, I will make sure my, child, my, my children go to school. And he obviously gets six girls. There were six girls in our family. <laughs> <laughs> and education became an important part of it. So I grew up with that. I grew up with the sense of a leader, but also the sense of education being extremely important and the investment they put in us. In terms of my achievement, um, it's very interesting because um, I, I always tell people I, I have been leading three big organizations. At UNDP, I was the head of the, Envi the environment program in Africa, at same as Conservation International, and now at the World Wide Fund for Nature, where I, I am the leader. But I am not a conservation biologist. And I am not what you'd call, I mean, I, I guess I am a scientist, but I, I am not a wildlife biologist like my father was. But what I feel I bring is the understanding that conservation is a part of a bigger picture. The systems, that it is part of a bigger system. And the need to realize that conservation, it sits with everything else, whether it's education, whether it's health, whether it's, uh, it's uh, livelihoods. And I feel that for me, that is my big, that journey and being able to bring that and bring that to all the organizations where I've worked is what I, I've, I feel is my biggest contribution. <laughs> Morning. I was trying to wait and be somewhere at the last so that I look around this panel and I think which slice of my life will I take because, yes. <laughs> because I probably think that everyone on this panel is younger than me. <laughs> and that's very helpful. <laughs> yeah. um, in terms of uh, what has influenced me most, I could I could pick up anything. I could say my mother, my aunt people that I have worked with, etc. But at the moment where I am in my lifetime, I think it's 
so many things. But most importantly, the women in the grassroots areas of the many countries where I have worked. For the last 43 years, I've been working in women's leadership, and I have, uh, I'm just coming back home after those 43 years. 20, 20 years I was based in Switzerland, in Geneva, Switzerland, working globally, and 20 years in the USA, working globally. And um, Stanford did a, a, a study of for the countries that I have visited and worked in, and it's a total of 157 countries, <laughs> plus the latest being the Antarctica. <laughs> now, when you visit and relate to people, what you come out is to realize that your mother's porridge is really good, but other mothers also make some porridge yes. <laughs> as well. And you can survive on other mother's porridge as well. So with that, I have come to believe that really there is so much commonality in our lives as people of the world. And I strive in my leadership, I've been a CEO three times, I strive in my leadership to get that collective, collaborative leadership that we can all own to make a difference. And I believe in as far as environment is concerned, it is people who actually make it or destroy the environment. So in all of my leadership work, I've always felt and known and implemented the fact that environment is part of it. When I worked at the Packard Foundation, which funds quite a lot of environmental uh, groups, uh, running and managing their $50 million fund, I knew that some of it needed to go to the people who are working in conservation. I've been the CEO of the Global Fund for Women. I knew that we needed to fund climate change and environment as well. I'm passionate about making money help people do what they need to do not just having it, and we'll be talking more about this. Um, so, so I guess, the, first of all, I love Africa. I love being here. I, I, I wish I was born in Africa sometimes when I see <laughs> the opportunities and the possibilities in conservation here compared to the challenges we face in India. I think you guys have so much going right and be optimistic about this continent. <coughs> it's incredible, right? Um, to me, my two greatest inspirations are my parents. My mom actually was the first Dr. Karanth in the family. She got her PhD 10 years before my dad, and we keep rubbing it in. <laughs> and um, simply because she was in she is an incredibly strong, independent woman, in it, and she was born in an India where people didn't get PhDs. It's in a different field, but she kind of raised me to be very independent, very opinionated, uh, and a very, um, I think, passionate about what I do. But it was my dad who really took me into the world of conservation. Um, I was a year old when he first took me to the jungles in India. I saw my first tiger and leopard by the time I was two. I was tr tracking them by 8, I was camera trapping them by 15, and by 17 I wanted to retire from this field <laughs> because I saw the very hard side of conservation, I saw his lab being burnt down, I saw his colleagues uh, being persecuted and, and a lot of court cases being slapped on for taking on the government. So between 1 and 17 I said, you know, I love nature, I love being in the wild, but I actually don't want to be either in wildlife science or conservation. It was actually going to the US as an undergraduate, I've, you know, and studying there where I realized, you know what, I love doing what he does and there's room for two of us to do this. <laughs> and, and we do very different things, but, but there is absolute need to, uh, to do good science and conservation in India. Um, in terms of, I, I find it very scary when people say greatest achievement. I think, um, That's smart. yeah, yeah. I, no, I just, I, I hope, I hope there's better stuff to come along the way. I've, I've done this for 22 years. I will do this as long as I am alive. Uh, what I am very <coughs> proud of was I spent the first decade of my life being a typical scientist, obsessed about publications and and putting out the best science. But somewhere along the way, the frustration grew that. I really wasn't having an impact either on the people or the wildlife I was trying to save in India. And for the last 10 years, every project that I've worked on has been trying to use science but actually have real world difference in conservation, in policy, and, and so you can see change. And uh, five years ago, we launched a project called Wild Survey, which assists people file for compensation claims. 
um, using a toll-free number. Our staff of 10 assist people, half a million people, and well, they have received uh, about a half a million dollars from the government. We as an NGO don't pay compensation. The money comes from the government for their losses of crops from elephants and livestock from tigers and leopards. And, but when we realized that we were not reaching the kids, so about a year and a half ago, we launched a conservation education program that has now scaled to 20,000 kids living in rural areas around these parks. And these are the kids who actually see tigers and leopards and elephants but live in fear of them. And I know we had made an impact where, you know, we've been running the first program for a year. We were not getting calls from certain villages. We started running the school program, and the kids are making their parents call us when they have a conflict incident. And so for me, it's that coming that full circle where you're able to help communities, but also inspire kids to care for wildlife and wild places. And, and I'm hoping we can do a lot more, scale this and partner with people around the world and get these kind of programs up and running. Uh, well, I think one thing that's pretty incredible is that I think there are three twins on stage. <laughs> okay, are you identical? With <laughs> time. Okay, well, her and I are both identical twins, so that's pretty incredible. <laughs> um, so thinking about what prepared me, I think we've all kind of said family, because I think family is very important. And I had a matriarch in my family, my grandmother, uh, who was a very small, strong Egyptian woman. And uh, she taught me a lot from a very young age because Egypt was a place where you can't really speak up. Like the second a woman speaks up, you're like told to stop speaking. Uh, and she used to, and I, I couldn't help myself because I love to talk. So <laughs> <laughs> it was a constant thing. And she would say, don't worry, Lila, just go out there and say whatever you want. And so I think from that point on, I was, she always said, use your voice. Use your voice, it's your greatest thing because you're not very big. So, <laughs> And that was the start, um, and I think having a twin was actually really helpful. And I think it's hard for people who don't have a twin because it's a very special relationship, but it was like two of us. So I was, you know, I could do twice as much, right? <laughs> and I think that really kind of helped uh, inspire my, my, my leadership skills. Um, and, but I also think uh, failure is very important, um, you know, we all fail, but being able to fail and learn from that failure, it builds resilience. And resilience is kind of just a really important part of leadership, particularly working in the environmental space. Uh, it's tough working in the field, it's really tough. Yes, camps being burned down, um, you know, being in you know, the front lines with uh, spears being thrown at animals or whatever. It's a really difficult thing, being blamed for things that you're not part of being the only woman in a meeting, uh, you know, and with a government or with, you know, a community and being blamed uh, because of your gender. Uh, it's tough. It's a really difficult thing. And so I think part of that is being able to push through that and figure out how to lead even when you have all of those, those difficult times happening. Uh, and then being able to pay that forward and, and work with others on how when those things happen, that it's the norm. It is the norm now, but we have to change that norm. I think we all are in a place where we can start shifting those norms into a way where that's not okay. Um, and I, you know, I think that's a privilege to be able to be in that space. So, thank you. That was, uh, connects right into the next question. Tila, thank you for that. Uh, so for many people in our audience today, this may be the very first all-woman panel that you've attended at an international conference. How many people in the audience have attended an all-woman panel before? Wow, okay. So this is a first, and it's definitely a first for Pathways. Um, so my question for our guests, how do you think being a woman affects how you lead? And you were talking about this. Can you give an example of time when you noticed this? <laughs> that question is equivalent to just saying, you know, how do you know that being your person, whatever that person will be, you could be black, you could be woman. It's so natural to be woman <laughs> that when you lead as a woman, 
you know from the gut that you are leading as a woman and why. What for me, um, it's been partially when I'm able to reflect and see how, uh, say, my mother led in the family. I have written, said many different things about my mother, including done a TED talk on my mother. <laughs> because I saw her lead in a natural way, where she was looking for every child of all of us, 10, and one of my sisters is sitting in the crowd, that we would, be, we would have a voice. And I have been mainly a manager of large organizations. And what I try to do is to create a place of work where I can be able to ensure that every member of the team, staff, uh, board, etc., do have a voice. And when I hear their comments, their feedback of something that is going wrong, that they are not having a voice, they are not able to give their ideas, I know that something is wrong in the same way as my mother would know when we would feel something is happening or we would have little um, sibling jealousies. It can be the same at work, as, as, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one of the women that you understand about uh, giving a voice to many different people. And daring with the resources that we have to do what we have to do. I've never felt limited because the organization I was managing had little money for as long as I had people. Because in our family when growing up, we didn't have lots of money. We each had sometimes you no know, shoes, bare food, but they were, we never felt disadvantaged and be talking in Africa, I know that this is an experience that many people will share. So again, that ability of a woman's <coughs> leadership that tells you it's not what you have, but what you are. Mm -hmm. I am able to take that to work as well. Mm -hmm. And the third thing that I want to speak to is um, the believing in others. I really believe that leadership is not a known thing. Mm -hmm. You don't lead alone. And especially if you're the top person, you are actually an inspirer, helping to create and do, but the leadership is coming from many people. Being able to acknowledge, give credit. I, I feel like it's part of my feminine path. And then feel good about giving credit. And not feel that it makes you a less person when you affirm others, when you give them credit for what they have done, and when you ask their opinions, and when you tell them to lift you up when you are failing, mm -hmm. so that you can learn from it. I believe these are all feminine traits that have helped me to provide leadership in very large organizations, international organizations, multicultural, and placed in various countries. Mm -hmm. I believe this is part of our feminine strength. Thank you. Um, so several stages in my life. Um, so I did talk about Agia, you know, my parents uh, raised, raised uh, you know, us to be strong. So when I, when I, read, I, I won a scholarship to go to the United States to study at the University of Wisconsin. And after that, I, I got a, a job at Sprint. Some of you in America will know Sprint. It's a telecommunication, <laughs> telecommunications company. And I started working, I, I, I loved it. This, this was a boom time in America in the 1990s. And there was an opportunity, an opportunity to apply for a promotion. And I applied and I didn't get it. But this one person who was really new to the position, to the, to the company got it. And it got me thinking, oh, what happened? So somebody, somebody said, Go and talk to the supervisor, ask her, why didn't you get this? Why, 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 didn't, why, why didn't she not choose you? And she said to me, Alice, I know you are, but I don't hear you. I don't, I don't hear you. And I realized then that I was brought up not to blow my own trumpet. I was blow, brought up that your work speaks for you. And I learned there, the turning point there was that you have to speak up. You have to speak up and you have to make sure your supervisor notices you. You have to make sure she knows what you're doing. And as an African, you know, back then I was young, you know, early in my 20s, this was, was not normal to me, but I learned it. So that was a good turning point. Another turning point for me, which relates a little bit to what Musim is talking about, about women's values and the values that we bring to work and our reluctance to lead, came to me when I joined this Antarctic voyage, <laughs> which Musimbi has been a part of and Colleen in the audience has been a part of. 
And I think the main message of that was why are women reluctant to leave? Why are we scared to go out there and be vulnerable? And it was very much about awakening us, awakening that leadership in us, and, and helping us to not be afraid to be out there and, and bring the soft skills. Because for a long time it was like the nice girl doesn't get the corner of it. You have to be tough, you have to be the bitch, you have to be the <laughs> man. <laughs> but that program for me, what I really got out of that program was, no, 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 you do not. And I, I think McKinsey has since produced a lot of studies to show about the soft skills and the women that lead companies, big companies, uh, soft skills actually do better. Th th these companies are doing better. And it was very important and t really turning point for me to say, yes, we can bring empathy. Empathy is a big part. We bring the team one, which is the thing that we about. We bring those soft skills. And it's something that I really, it, it is a, it's a something I'm working on more and more and really telling my team that, yes, you're a woman, lead like a woman. You bring the teamwork, you bring the empathy, you bring the understanding, and, and, and you don't have to say, you don't have to worry about the nice girl not getting the phone around. Thank you. I think I'll speak to my heritage, actually. So uh, when, I, when, when my twin sister and I were born, um, I don't think we even realized how lucky we were. So um, I have dual heritage. My grandmothers um, were fascinating women. So my South African grandmother, who's from the Eastern Cape, from Idu Chakolosa, uh, and Kosa woman, fierce as hell, um, <laughs> married a man and moved to Zambia and was in exile. Um, and then my Zambian grandmother, who's a Bemba woman, gets widowed at 40, left with eight children. And she was running an entire business she understood nothing about. She took herself in the 70s to night school. Learned what, I mean, she had only like grade seven education and she got herself into night school. She needed to understand accounting and everything. And, and it was fascinating. So for me, as a, as, as a young girl, sort of navigating these two worlds and suddenly realizing, oh my God, this women are incredible. My South African grandmother was the first non-Zambian to be the matron and head of the University Teaching Hospital in Zambia, which is the biggest hospital in Lusaka and in Zambia. My Bemba grandmother ran an entire machinery of a business. We own port one and two of my hometown. Because she sat on those committees and said, well, I will invest in this land. <laughs> my father has not worked a day in his life. He runs those businesses that my late grandmother left, and I have to remind him all the time that he took this woman to provide this leadership. But for me, what I want to say is Ubuntu, the power of community. There is nothing that is so fundamental when you have community. And for me, I learned from both of them to realize that invest in your community. Listen to your community. And thank you so much for bringing the element of just, even you know those people that hold you as as you falter, as you try and fall. And sometimes you have blind spots and you don't see what's actually coming at you. And I also want to say um, that the element of speaking up, my goodness, we all socialize, you know, shh, keep it down, you know, here we go, you know, keep it down. And, and like you, Lila, I think we were very lucky, my twin sister and I, and my grandparents were like, just, just say what you feel like say. And in fact, my Zambian family always says, it's your kosa blood that makes you talk a little bit too much. <laughs> you know, because Zambian people don't really talk that yeah. much. And thank you for my kosa blood, yeah. because this kosa blood has gotten me places and has helped me bring other women along. Mm -hmm. And also realize that it's, it's being able to have that voice to bring others along on this journey as well. I don't think I'm a typical Indian woman by any stretch, um, <laughs> simply because I grew up with two parents who believed that their only daughter could do anything. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a country where um, most Indian women kind of grow, grow up being told you can't do this and you can't do that. And so I actually grew up in a bubble. Uh, I went to the US and I, I was actually shocked by some of the glass ceilings that I discovered in, in America, particularly during my PhD, I collected my data and I wanted to have a child. I, had a, I, I chose to have a child during my PhD. And I think I was the first woman at Duke in the School of Environment <laughs> having a child during her PhD. And the kind of backlash that came at me was, you're not going to finish. What kind of message are you sending to the other women in the program? 
And then I'm happy to say I did finish in four years. I published more than a lot of the men <laughs> at the school of And then five more people had babies, including some men. So um, <laughs> everybody ultimately got their PhD. But it's this kind of pressure that we put on women that you have to make a choice between being single, being cho choosing to have a child, and, and, and your career. And I don't think, I think these are false choices. Mm -hmm. if, if you're, I think, relatively smart enough, you'll figure out a way to navigate this through your life. These are not black and white choices. And this is something we need to encourage women to really be confident about making these choices when it's the right time to do them. And then I went back to India, and after 13 years of living in the US, I was extremely argumentative, obnoxious, and opinionated. <laughs> <laughs> and people in India were just like, okay, tone down the American in you because <laughs> this is not going to work if you want to live in India long term. And what I've tried to do is I've I've tried to mentor both young men and women in India. I had the privilege of mentoring about 200 young Indian scientists and conservationists in the last decade. Some men, some women, um, and I don't think it's cute either way. But with the women, I've tried to put in that extra effort to just give them courage, give them confidence. Because a lot of them come from families where being a wildlife biologist is still a very extreme thing to do. You, women don't go to the jungle, they don't walk in the forest, they don't study animals, they don't live in remote parts of India. And, and just building courage and confidence and giving them opportunities and also getting them to think hard about, you know, don't be pressured to get married to someone because in India a lot of people are forced into arranged marriages and really think about hard about who you're going to end up with because that has a huge impact on how your career does or doesn't do well. And, and these are the kind of fundamental basic things that nobody talks to young women about, right? And, and I'm hoping that we can nurture this next generation of women uh, you know, uh, in a more constructive way. I, I run an uh, uh, Indian conservation NGO now where not by design, but 80% of the women we've hired, 80% uh, of people we've hired in the last year have been women. It's not because I've gone out looking for women, I've just found them more talented and more qualified at this point in time. as well because I had a co-director or I have a co-director 
Stephanie, I don't even know if she's here, um, who is an exceptionally compassionate, empathetic person. And I think that balanced me. Uh, and I've learned a lot from her, so I was very fortunate. I've learned a lot from the people I've worked with and the team that I have. And so I think in the last decade, the way that I lead is very different than I did earlier on. Um, I feel better about myself at the end of the day. I think that my role models were only men for quite a long time. I only worked with men. So I was acting like them because I didn't know there was another way to lead. Uh, I was aggressive. I was that bitch, you know, that we talked about. Because like, they just thought that was the way to do it. Uh, I, I was competitive uh, because that's what we thought. That's how we should lead. And it was horrible. It was really horrible. And I, I would go to sleep at night, like, feeling really bad and not knowing why I was feeling bad until finally I realized there is a different way to lead. Uh, and I had a lot of great role models around me and from community members and leaders in the community that I've worked with um, to, to my co-directors and other colleagues that have taught me to lead in a way that is much more productive and, and much more successful for everybody. So, yeah. Obviously, we start. We, we all came from that that uh, place of deadlines and, and do this and do that. But more and more, and yesterday I read a wonderful article in Harvard Business Review about leading empowered people. And I think we've moved away from that now because we are leading people who are empowered. I mean, my 12-year-old daughter, my gosh, my 13, 13 now, I can't even tell her anything. I mean, she knows what she wants to do, and you know, I can't say, say, oh, you need to do A, B, C, no, no way, you know? And I think more and more the workplace is about empowered leaders. And really, all we have to do is talk about, tell them the mission, this is the mission, and just step away, and let them figure out how they want to deliver that mission. Empower them, trust them, give them the tools, remove the obstacles. That is the kind of leadership that we find ourselves in now uh, than we were in 10 years ago. So in many ways, I feel like the, that leadership, the leadership arena has totally evolved now into that. We're leading millennials who also know what they want to do. They, they want to achieve this, they want to stay for long, yeah, yeah. They don't, don't want to be in these jobs. So more and more, I think we are, we as leaders, we're no longer have, we no longer have to be the smartest people in the room. That was the title of the article. How to lead without being the smartest person in the room. And really we're learning that we're adjusting, really all of us are adjusting to that. But, and I think as, as women, we do this very well. We do this very well because we grew up with our mothers juggling all of these things and leading from behind, but really, truly leading. I, I just say, want to say ditto to everything that you said. Um, <laughs> I can maybe add on it. Um, for me, passion, in the beginning, it was uh, what I found me to continue in leadership was when other people, when very, at a very young age, other people noticed that maybe I would provide some leadership. Right from the time of being in the girl guides, mm -hmm. being in the 4K club, mm -hmm. being in the white teams, and very often being at school, very often I would be given a task of leadership. You'll be the prefect, you'll be something. And somehow it began to build some idea that there's something about leadership. I remember we had um, um, wildlife clubs in schools. And um, it, so that after school we had all of these uh, um, uh, extracurricular activities. And um, uh, in, one of, in my school, in primary school, um, I was uh, elected to be a leader to help some of the other kids choose an animal that you're going to be friends with for the rest of your life. <laughs> I had my elephant. I still have my elephant. <laughs> and I always try my life. And the fact that I was asked to be the leader and help the others, and then we learn about those animals and we give presentations to each other it was really important for me to realize where leadership was going. And then also in the, in, while I was still in high school here, I was uh, elected to represent our country to a meeting of young people, United Nations organized meeting. And we went to India to study the population. And we went to Indonesia. We went to the then Soviet Union, etc. And just traveling and seeing the others. In fact, in the Soviet Union, the kids from Latin America were in, really, they, they had it. We admired. They smoked. <laughs> 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 they, they, 
they snicked some goose. <laughs> and we ourselves, we were brought up really to be completely religious. All those things were sins. <laughs> so we learned that you don't do them for health or for anything, but you don't do them because you don't want to sin. So as young people, we were like admiring with one eye and feeling guilty with the other. <laughs> We didn't want to see it, but they are so they are so rich and they knew so much about the world and we but somehow we survived it and I think that it was a, a means of seeing other people lead and you are aided learning about how when you are very young you can be influenced either to do good or to do things that you might not manage in your own life at a particular time but sailed through them then came on and was leading the uh, Kenya was part I, I Kenyans, how many people are Kenya here? Yes. So, I want to let you know that I competed with Orengo, who is known in this country, to be the Secretary General of the United Nations Youth Association of Kenya. And I won. <laughs> and that was such an empowerment for me, because he was a man, and he was well known, even as a student, etc. And uh, it really gave me the courage of leading, being able to compete and to see that you have to give yourself to something. Mm. Sometimes people mm. see you and sometimes you have to volunteer for it. Mm. So throughout my leadership, I'm telling women and men and other people, if you see something that you want to do, you have to put your name out there. Mm. Even if you fail or you don't, give, or you pass for it, but you have to put your name there because it gives you the courage. And then. Um, the other thing that I think over, the, over, over time has to be important for me in leadership is to have something of your own that you always go back to. Mm -hmm. For me, I grew up in a Quaker family where being justice was part. If you, come, if you know anything about Quakers, mm -hmm. the issue about justice mm -hmm. and peace internally for yourself and for the others is what puts the Quakers together. When you are working in Western countries, you're not, you don't even mention anything about your spirituality or your religiosity or whatever it is. But inside me, I have lived with knowing that a faith connection to justice and to peace helps me deal with things that even religious people don't deal with. So I have been able, right from the beginning during the days of HIV, to really speak strongly about use of things like condoms. Uh, talk about sex workers, talk about subjects such as um, abortion, etc. Because I believe from my faith that I had been brought on that if God loves everybody, God must be able to want good for everybody. And it's not what people think about other people. And when you go with a, a justice issue, you are arguing either for the animals or for the plants or for the people, for the sake of justice and not for the sake of what people think about those particular things. That has been very important in my leadership. And then the final one that I, I want to point to is uh, uh, recognitions help you, but you have to be able to know how to use them. Mm -hmm. So in 2018, I was named together with Bill Gates as the one of the nine people who had made a difference in the environmental change. I say to myself, Bill Gates and myself? Yeah. That's really fun. They are quite a number. They are some people. But I, this is not about me because we've been working in the environment with many people. I'm really going to use this recommendation to make sure that the people who I have supported, who are working in the environment, really have a, a place. They really have a place. So I would say to them, this is about your work that made me be recognized. And I want to make sure that you are recognized. So using recognitions and the leadership being on top to really be a voice for the others has been very useful for me. Every place that I have gone to work, I have sought to change it to ensure that it, it, there is diversity. Uh, some places have been the first African. Some places have been only a few of us women. Some places have been the first, like when I led to be the CEO of the uh, Worldwide WC. After 150 years, there are never had a patient a Latin American, an African, it was always from Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and even the people from our community were afraid to vote for people who look like us because they thought, what if we fail, mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. But when I 
accepted to be that position, I knew that I needed to change the way that people look at position, mm -hmm. at that position. So really hard work, at the, at, at the place of work, really trying to live out what I see as my values without imposing them on the others. Because you can make every place of work be an inclusive of many opinions, many diversities, any diversity you can think of, if first you accept that that's a, a part of what we need to do in leadership. And that has been important for me. I, I decided to retire from full-time work. Mm -hmm. I decided in America you can work as much as, as long as you want because I want to rewire. And I'm rewiring to work in much more detailed way in climate change and environmental protection. Mm -hmm. So this journey is uh, a beginning for me. I love it and I believe that our biggest success in leadership it's not only acknowledging how our parents brought up, etc. Because when you are working as an adult, you have other partners in life, including when you are a woman, your house partner, who that partner is, your spouse, who that spouse is. And I think that for me it's been very important to acknowledge and to see what it has meant for us to co-parent my partner and myself, to have children, co-rear them, co-parent them, discuss about them and finance them and feel really good about the fact that I am not, when I go to work and my husband is in charge, he is in charge and I don't need to remote control. And he knows that. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for your input. I, I, I just want to pick up a little bit on something that you said uh, on the elephant. I actually come from the elephant clan uh, because I'm matriarchal on both sides of my heritage. And, um, and elephants have memory. And they're quite beautiful regal animals. Um, and then at the same time, um, I just want to say two things. In fact, I picked the, the value that I picked is persistence. Um, but I also want to mention empathy. I was that woman because uh, I had my children pretty late, in my late 30s. And I was that woman who would be on a flight and I'd hear those children screaming and, you know, please, oh God, yeah. do something about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Until I had a bath. Yeah. And then I understood, you know, the pressure on the airplane and children scream and, oh my goodness. And that has taught me a lot uh, in, in terms of leadership. Children teach you a lot. They ground you. Uh, <laughs> But also at the same time, uh, the element of persistence, I think I want to mention uh, very quickly that um, one thing for me that, that, that's been so wonderful and, and really uh, empowering is that I transcended different things at different times. I was the young scientist on the river in Zambia looking at water hyacinth. People remember the water hyacinth time, the dramatic week? Uh, and I'm going to meet with a minister and the minister would be like, who is she again? <laughs> She's a scientist. Okay. Um, and then I'll trans I moved to Europe, and I've not lived in Zambia since 97, and then of course I'd be the black woman, the only black woman in that meeting. And I'm like, so who's she again? Yeah. The Zambian. The Zambian. <laughs> oh, yes. um, and then move along, oh, who's, is it the mother of two? Yeah, the Zambian, the, mother, the African woman. So in navigating all these different places, how do I present myself in all of these beings or whatever? I have to be authentic, I have to be me. That's all I can bring to that space, and, and that's what I also have tried to bring in the teams that I'm managing, and also being really empathetic, because I realize a lot more in organizations, the UN is a case in point, uh, deliver, 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 we've got this big meeting, come on, come on, you said your child was sick, come on, come on, man. But the children get sick, and, and for me, I, I, I've had to really, and they're bullies in workplaces, so how do you even confront those bullies? Well, let her speak, let her have a voice, or well, let him speak. How do you manage all of that? Because we're, we're, we're spending most of our human lives in these spaces, and then we find ourselves depressed and happy, and all of that, and, and quite frankly, we have to really be empathetic. And that's really taught me a lot as, as I journeyed along the way, and continues to teach me. Uh, I think I want to actually pick up on what Gila said. I, I kind of see myself mirroring a lot of what he said. Um, what, I, what I've kind of I'm not an empathetic person. I'm not a. I'm, I'm an extremely impatient person. So I've heard, <laughs> uh, learned very slowly to be empathetic, compassionate, and more patient. 
Um, but I've also learned to be kinder to myself. I think mm. we forget mm -hmm. that all of us have huge struggles in this field. And, and we're so tough on ourselves when we don't do well or we don't achieve something within a stipulated time period. I think it is OK to slow down a little bit and be kind to yourself. Mm -hmm. and, and like you said, um, I mean, I've, I have a husband and, and two daughters. And an earlier version of me would have just gone all out, and I still do go all out, but I do carve that, that time for these people who ground you and, and care for you and very deeply, and whether it's your twin sister or your parents or your spouse or your children, they matter. Uh, and I think you need to make sure that those relationships don't fracture in your obsession to achieve mass conservation and science goals, right? And just to slow down a little bit is okay. <laughs>
This person has been with me for 12 years. She's been looking after my children for 12 years. I didn't, I did not have a husband. So this was the most, I made that choice. I left that job. I left that job because of my life. I left that job because I realized that I could get a job, I could get a career in future, but my children, at the time I was losing with them, I would never get back. And here I am, I am a worker. Mm -hmm. So you can do it, you can do these choices, you can make these choices. As tough as they are, you can make these choices. Mm -hmm. I, I want to respond to a couple of the, 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 the questions. Well, what's your um, question on the opportunities? Um, and, and also um, the younger lady, Irene, on, on, I want to start with that actually. I've been to several conferences, and, and it's very fascinating when you meet and encounter young people. My God, you're so amazing, you're so successful, and oh, oh my God, oh my God, the story goes on. And I don't know how many of you have seen that, that picture of the iceberg, where you see just the top of the iceberg, right? And the bottom is a lot of things that you've navigated. And for me to circumvent that, because a lot of time I'm really sharing my stories, I started a blog, and I, and I set up my own website, missondamumba.com, and I write my journey. How did I get here? I, I document this journey. And talking about money, a lot of young people don't realize that um, it's taking care of that environment where we belong that's important. Yes, that employment in Africa is huge, and I do not disrespect that. But also, it's a big, wide, blue world. And I think that's what we also need to let kids know, that you can be anywhere that you want to be. I moved from Zambia in 97. I applied for an internship in Switzerland. My French was, half of my family is from Congo. I know more from this. <laughs> Today, I, I run all my meetings either in French or English or whatever. But also really beginning to encourage them that really this is your future. And what may be seemingly, oh yeah, you don't have food on the table, or you, you don't have a job, or you don't have money. Think, think how you will navigate that. Because a lot of times there's that just drive. Oh my God, I saw that man with a Mercedes. I need the Mercedes. These this really material things that don't matter. How do we really bring young people as part of this journey to take care of the environment? Because the environment really also pays off and really takes care of us. Um, the issue of... Um, <laughs> I was in a situation once where uh, I applied, I shall not name the university in England. Um, I applied for this fellowship. I mean, I had over seven years experience before I did my PhD. and uh, and very prestigious university, and I remember calling in, and first of all, the, the lady was like, sorry, your name was it Musunda, Masindi, how do you pass it again? And I said, Musunda, please don't say Musunda, because Musunda in my language is to pee. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and then she says, well, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid, you know, you really did make the cut, and blah, blah, blah. And fast forward, I investigate and find out that actually a, a man was given the position. And we just happened to meet at a conference with a gentleman who was the hiring manager seven years later. Uh, and I said, well, you know, I'd applied for this postdoc, and oh my god, your credentials are in impressive, impressive. I said, well, I wasn't picked, actually. The gentleman you picked had three years' experience. Really? I'm like, do you know? And they did. Um, and sometimes we need to call it out. Yeah. We need to call it out. A lot of times we don't. We just let it pass, and yeah. that can be problematic. Okay, maybe I'll talk about a challenge uh, in, in, the, in the leadership space. Uh, I think competition is a big one. I think we can't just kind of pretend it doesn't exist because particularly in the environmental space where everybody's looking for funding and money, uh, you're always like competing with someone. Uh, and that competition uh, you know, is one of our, our biggest issues in our field. It's, it ruins the opportunities for people to collaborate because people don't want to collaborate, they don't want to share. Uh, because if I have a good idea, I might as well keep it because I need the money. And I think that, and I just, I'm going to actually tell a story here with, with you because we were both going up for the Rolex Award last year. I think we had met maybe one time in the last 20 years at some conference, but we both known, known about each other. And we were at this Rolex Awards, and there's about uh, 10, 15 people or whatever, and you know, it's a lot of money. And it was wonderful. It was when we had such a moment, and there was no competition. And it was like, I just wanted you to get the vibe. I was like, get it. What, you, what you're doing is so important, I really want you to have it. And hence, fast forward, now we're here on the same panel. Uh, and. <laughs> 
got to meet her, her beautiful family and her daughters, and they're amazing. And it's, that's what happens, right? You get past that. And when we can embrace a mindset of abundance, when we know there is enough, there is enough out there. Absolutely. But we need to see that together and we need to go there together. Uh, and once you start giving and start appreciating that there is enough, you will start seeing more and more come on, and you will start seeing that the impact is increasing substantially. We can do a lot more together. And so I think that's one thing that uh, we need to really continue to think about how we can share, how we can get into a space where we're not being insecure. Because we're not insecure. When we have each other, I feel very secure on sitting on this stage with all of you right now. because it's difficult to explain them and to learn. But when you work internationally, you don't only deal with the issues of being a woman, you also deal with the issues of race. And they are very real. You can be in a group of loving white women, and you are all women, and your blackness becomes very important. And if you're black and you come from Africa, very often people think that we know so little. So when people start to talk to you, when you are outside, they talk down on you. Mm -hmm. You can be on a panel, I've been on a panel with journalists, and everybody on the panel is asked big questions, evolving <laughs> in the whole world, and they have asked a question that is very original, very village, and I love it, because I take a very good advantage of it. <laughs> I lift the big question of the village up to the point to which belongs, yes. I bring it to the table, yeah. and then I take up the issue of the world like everyone else. Mm. But you can, <laughs> you can the intention, the talent, the intention is that you can't articulate global economics, mm. you can't articulate global um, um, uh, politics, you can't articulate big thinking of what changes in the world. And sometimes people begin by looking at what has not worked for our continent. It's a big challenge. I was only last um, year, in, uh, in, in May, so we are in this big conference like this one, and there is uh, uh, someone from Australia who uh, is next to me and uh, is talking me into why I'm in the leadership. We are all so-called important people, CEOs, I was still a CEO, also, and everybody's a CEO. And the first question you asked me is, is are African leaders still corrupt? <laughs> so I said, yes. <laughs> and I asked him, sir, are Australian priests still abusing children? <laughs> So I tell you, 
in the early days when I used to pack, like these are the five napkins for the for the five days, mm -hmm. and I come back, and this is the food, etc., etc., and uh, then I come back, and everything I packed was not used, and I asked him, and he said, "You said you are going to poor parity. Why are you making yourself superior more than myself?" <laughs> <laughs> that helped me. I didn't realize that we women can be so possessive that we don't actually open up the space for the people who want to be co with us or help to teach that topic. So now I appreciate men who accept co-parenting and I would like them to take that position with dignity and for us not to think that they can't do it. They can do it when they want to do it. And many men, especially many younger men, are wanting to do it. So the third last thing that I want to mention about is, is uh, I think we should be respectful to people when they make their choices yes. and not condemn them. We should really like work with them. And if you are a leader who leads an organization, listening to the parents, to the women, can help you change the policies of the organization. You can introduce different working places. And you should not be afraid to give people opportunity to manage their life cycle of parenting during that particular time. You benefit a lot. For example, you can hire a woman who is seven months pregnant or eight months pregnant, and they appreciate the fact that you hire them. Mm -hmm. They go, they have a baby, and they come back more appreciative, yes. and you get a lot more from them. Absolutely. Or you negotiate the working hours. Mm -hmm. So we should not be afraid to change the policies, mm -hmm. because these policies have been oppressed into women for a long time. Uh, but also at the same time really being patient 
to listen to all these elements of expertise, because everybody, especially the scientists and conservationists, they want to be the expert at the table, they're always the expert, my voice matters and my opinion matters, so how do we really reach a level of consensus? And it's interesting, sitting from the UN, because that's what we do, we have to have a level of consensus, um, but sometimes, does it work, does it not work? But I think the manner of listening is important, and the science is obviously very important. And I also want to give an example. And I, I, for me, it's inclusive conservation. And I want to talk about an example in Uganda, where I come from, where in 1994, the Global Environment Facility gave a grant to establish the Bwindi Mgahinga Trust Fund to protect the last remaining mountain gorillas. You have, some of you will definitely know about, have known about that, and you probably have been there. Um, this, is a, this park is a, is, a, this is a protected park. These gorillas are very important. But around these gorillas, obviously, there are people who live around the indigenous people. And I remember that, that grant, the rules of that grant were that they would, these communities would apply for grants for activities that would reduce pressure of the park. So the first round of applications came in, and all they asked for was schools and hospitals and solar. And the grant, the, the grant making body at the time said they were very confused. We didn't know what to do. The rules from the global environment facility were very strict. We needed to do things that were alternative livelihoods, reducing pressure of the park. So they struggled there. Then second round, same thing. Third round, same thing. Eventually, they, they gave in and they started funding. They built hospitals, they built maternity centers, they did uh, solar. And as I speak right now, that part, the gorillas have recovered from where they were maybe 10 years ago to now 1,000, and it's booming. And it's bo booming because of this. It is not booming because of anything that we did about conservation. It's booming about the people, about listening to people's needs. And so for me, this is a very big lesson and a big lesson for us who work in conservation. That I mentioned earlier, it's, it is a system. We, we, are, we are sitting in a system. We sit in a system where everything else around us matters and we cannot achieve anything until we've dealt with everything around us that matters. And just realizing at that moment that um, we could not achieve the conservation of those mountain gorillas until we had put the schools there and we had put the hospitals and the maternity centers and continue to invest in them was an important humble experience. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's still true today. And it still talks earlier again about the collaboration that we all talked about. <coughs> conservation of nature is not just for conservation. Yes, the science matters, but it's not just for us. It's for everyone. It's for all of us in this room. All of us, when we see that elephant, we love it. When we see the zebra, we love it. We all resonate with the air that we breathe. We all resonate with climate change. It is for all of us. All of us are part of this. And actually, without all of us, we do not achieve what we're trying to achieve. Actually, this what's unfolding now is it, it, it's an active story. I don't think there's a conclusion to it yet. But um, so we've been helping people file for compensation in India for <coughs> almost five years now. And when I received the Rolex award, the Indian government came completely after me. Um, and everywhere we went, we were very specific, saying we were getting to a place, helping these families file their claims within the first 48 hours of something happening. And, and the money was always coming from the government. We never made the payments. But when this international recognition came, uh, the government decided that they wanted to launch their own app. And I was actually, a lot of people thought I'd be very angry. I was super happy because if they launch their own app and they're able to deliver the services that they were originally meant to deliver, <laughs> then we as an NGO can go on and work on other conservation issues that need our time and attention. And um, so it's, I, I don't know what's going to happen um, because we're helping people, the government's trying to help people. We're beginning to hear now that corruption has seeped into their own app where people are kind of fudging numbers on what they lost mm -hmm. with the park guard saying you add an extra number and then give me the difference. And so the, the things that we had weeded out over the last five years in terms of taking corruption out, taking cash payments out, making them electronic payments, trading people bank accounts, all the stuff we had cleaned up seems to be unfolding again. 
But it's also taught me, I think, a lot of the times as NGOs, we get frustrated with the government, and then we go out on our own, and we want to do our own thing. But sometimes it, I think, helps to also take a pause when something like this happens and say, okay, let me try and figure out how can I work with the government? Because, again, not all government officials are bad. There's a lot of good people in the government who want to help you and will work with you, and it's just figuring out what <coughs> those guys are. Um, and, and so I've always believed in collaborating with people different from us. So I'm very happy that we work with a legal uh, think tank in India, and we've now drafted a compensation law for the country. Uh, it, it is, uh, we're pushing it through in, in my state, which has the highest conflict, Karnataka, but eventually it's something that can be adopted across the country because we found that each state, uh, India has 30 states, and everybody was doing their own thing. So if you had elephant conflict in one state, it was valued and treated differently uh, compared to a neighboring state. And these animals are moving across borders, across parks, mm -hmm. but how you deal with human death, human injury, crop damage, property damage, and livestock predation varies depending on which state you happen to live in. So we're differentially treating human life and human loss, but the animals are the same. And so we're, I'm hoping to push, uh, you know, this is something I would have never imagined actually from the very top is fundamentally changing the law and how this is applied for the country. It, it may take a while, but I think the science, the conservation, the field experiences matter, but sometimes thinking of other solutions can have impact as well. Thank you.